The combined trends of increased inequality and decreasing mobility pose a fundamental threat to the American dream, our way of life, and what we stand for around the globe. And it is not simply a moral claim that I'm making here. There are pra practical consequences to rising inequality and reduced mobility. President Obama talking about the growing gulf between the rich and poor in the United States. 1984, during the Reagan years, upper income families were 3.4 times wealthier than middle income families. That number now, according to Pew Research, almost doubled to 6.6 .6 times greater. Even more startling, the super rich now have 70 times the wealth of lower income Americans. Linda Torado writes about her own struggles of being poor in her book, Hand to Mouth. Linda joins us live. Linda, the rich are succeeding in this economy. The poor are not keeping up. Why? Um, well, I mean, the rich people write the rules. I think that's the first thing that we need to realize is that any system uh, pretty much exists to exist. And whichever system we put into place, it's going to do that. Right now, we're doing things like making sure that tax rates go down on capital gains, but we're not worried about payroll taxes, things like that. So when we reinforce all of these systems that, that create wealth for those who already have it and depress wealth for those who don't have startup capital, it's really no surprise that we wind up like this. It's a trend that's been happening for decades now. It's just only now that we're starting to realize it's the actual problem. The American dream is anyone can succeed in this economy. Hard work, determination, it can lift you up from the lower end to the higher end of the economic spectrum. Do you still believe in that dream? You know, I don't even think that's what the dream's been. I think the dream is always that if you work hard and, and you do what you need to do, that you'll... is no way to run an economy. The idea that we have to wait for book deals and, and to go viral and, and to be on American Idol or win the lottery to get out of our situations is kind of a ridiculous way to, to encourage people to move up. Well, Linda, you mentioned capital gains, but the president did raise the highest tax rates for the richest Americans to 39.6 percent. Yet we continue to see the huge disparity in the wealth in this country. What can be done legislatively to ensure that all Americans are really doing well in this economy? Well, I think it's a question of priorities. Like today we found out that the F-35 bomber that we've just been spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on, by the time it comes off the rails, is actually going to be more outdated than the equipment we're already using now. And we're spending so much money on these projects, and sure they create some jobs, but they're not creating as many jobs as that money could if used other ways. There's any number, I mean, left, right, both will tell you there are places to find money in the budget. We spend money like water. It's a question of where we put our money because the budget is a moral document it's a statement of what you believe in what you're willing to put your money behind and we in america right now we're not willing to put our money behind our people well linda it seems like you're right now you're pointing the finger at a lot of people other than maybe personal responsibility for people that aren't doing as well in this economy as others and one of the explanations offered is that lower income americans more likely to sell their homes stocks and other investments to get through the recession do you agree that maybe some of the people that are on the other end of the economic spectrum they take some blame as well as the fact that they're not doing as as great as they should be in this economy Look, I think everybody makes bad decisions. Everybody makes a bad call from time to time. The question is, do we uniquely demonize one class of people for doing so? And in this country, we do. Most people would say that selling your assets when you're short on cash and it doesn't look like you're going to get a job anytime soon is actually the responsible way to go about things. It's to get out of those contracts and not be encumbered by them. And what's more, to get the capital that you can out of them. I don't understand how somebody is going to say, well, you lost your job and you had a medical emergency but what you shouldn't have done is sold your home, even though you were completely penniless and it looked likely they were going to take it from you anyway. And, and those are the situations in which you find people selling their assets. Nobody just up and sells their home on a whim for cash. They need the money and they need it for real reasons. So I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing to do. I don't think it's necessarily a fault. I think the fault is that they're in the position that they have to do that to begin with. Because what you find is most people who are in that situation are there as a result of medical bills, as a result 
result of an accident or a layoff, something out of their control. So how you respond to an uncontrollable event is sure in your purview, but if you don't have any good options, how can you look at somebody and say you made a bad choice? What can the federal government do to reduce this disparity? A lot of people have mentioned the minimum wage, possibly to increase that. Would that create a lot of change in America? And what other possible legislative remedies would you offer up? I would actually say to close the loopholes. I agree wholeheartedly with the right when they say we need to go through the tax code with a fine tooth comb and get rid of all of the things that are messing things up. Right now, you've got people spending unimaginable sums of money trying to make sure that their money is offshore, trying to make sure that it's safe from taxation. I mean, Warren Buffett says, I do that. Why wouldn't you? That system exists. So let's change the system and make it not so attractive to, to not participate in the society at the pace that society is helping you out. When you're on the bottom, if you're taking food stamps, there's not a whole lot you can give back. If you're taking a home mortgage tax deduction and a business lunch, I'm pretty sure you can afford 20 cents. So it's a question of what perspective are you looking at it in and who's involved in the conversation. Another thing that I'd love to see is more people who are affected by these laws actually being the ones in the rooms helping draft them. Most of the, the regulations and the rules that we see, at least in the bottom third of America, are, are nonsensical at best and counterproductive. If we could get people that actually live those lives in the room to help draft the policies, you'd see way more effective programs. And I think that that's probably true up and down the scale, although I'm thinking that uh, Jamie Dimon probably has enough access already. He's probably got enough numbers. He's probably cool. Well, Linda, I wanted to ask you, do you think the gulf will continue to widen and what societal problems will happen as a result of this increasing income inequality? Our founding fathers and the philosophers that they relied on warned us that a country made up of multiple societies cannot stand. I do think the trend continues and I find it worrisome because we are really turning into very different societies where a poor person from the south and a rich person from the north will have absolutely nothing in common despite their shared you know, American-ness. And the same goes with east or west or rural and urban. We are dividing. We're doing it along class, race, gender, political affiliation affiliation, what have you, and we are stopping thinking of ourselves as Americans first. When we do that, we risk our country and we risk this great experiment that we've embarked upon. We can do better and we have to do better because whether you're on food stamps or whether you're Warren Buffett, you still benefit from being an American. This Linda, is still one of the best countries in the world. I agree with you. I'm going to jump in right there. The book is called Hand to Mouth. Thanks so much for being on Midpoint. Police in New York remain on high alert today. This is the NYPD prepares to say goodbye to a couple of foreign officers. Authorities arrested seven people for making threats against police, either through social media or via phone. The crackdown comes after two officers were ambushed and killed last week in Brooklyn. Former President George H.W. Bush remains in Houston Hospital today. He was hospitalized after experiencing shortness of breath earlier this week. A spokesman for the 90-year-old says Bush is in great spirits. And a nasty winter storm could spell trouble for people in the Rockies all the way to the Midwest. Denver already has a foot of snow, and the storm is expected to creep east towards the Great Lakes. I'm Francesca Page. We'll have another update coming for you at the top of the hour. Remember, as always, stay connected with us at Newsmax.com.